Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to another webinar sponsored by your dog's friend. I hope you're as excited to watch this webinar as I am. But first, let me tell you something about our speaker. Carrie Hoare is the owner and trainer at Crimson Hound in La Crosse, Wisconsin, a certified professional dog trainer, fear-free certified professional, and a family dog mediator. Based on the work of trainer and author Kim Brophy, Family Dog Mediation looks at how the dog's legs, which stands for learning, environment, genetics, and self, have come together to create the dog sitting in front of us and uses realistic goal setting, management protocols, and when necessary, teaches new behaviors. We will learn more about all of this in the webinar. Please put your questions in chat. We will get to them at the end and hopefully we'll get to all of them, but we will definitely get to as many as possible. I also wanna mention that these webinars are made possible by your donations. If you are inclined to donate, any amount would be fine and you would go to our homepage in the top right corner where there's an icon for donations. We appreciate whatever you can do. I know that we will all learn a lot today. Now over to you, Carrie. Thank you, Deborah. Um, we are gonna talk about family dog mediation. Um, I'm gonna teach you first a little bit about legs, the background of that. And then I've got a couple of um, made up case studies that um, I want to kind of walk you through just to give you an idea of what um, a typical family dog mediation session would kind of look like. Um, so to start, um, I wanted to start off with showing the trailer for The Dog's Truth, which is um, Kim Brophy's uh pet parent version of the family dog mediator course. And I thought that would give us a really nice little introduction to what we're talking about today. So um, I think the vo volume's working, but let me know if it's not. So let's watch this for a minute.
All right, so a little preview into what is family dog mediation. Um, so as um, Deborah mentioned, this is a concept developed by Kim Brophy, who is a um, applied ethologist and a, um, canine behavior consultant. Um, it is not a dog training philosophy. Um, so many different types of trainers are family dog mediators. Um, what of this is, is basically a holistic lens um, with which we can better understand why a behavior is happening in the dogs and then better able to work through ways to help the client and help the dog with that behavior. Um, so you can be a certified family dog mediator just by taking the course, or you can um, be a licensed family dog mediator by applying for licensure and having certain qualifications in your division. Um, and I am a licensed family uh, dog mediator in the training division. Um, the legs, um, the, the, the concept is legs is based on a dog's phenotype. Um, so what his legs are, um, when we think about dogs, dogs have four legs. So it's kind of an easy kind of way to, to migrate that to a legs concept. Dogs have four legs. And if one of the legs isn't working right, if it's injured, et cetera, then the other three legs are going to have to compensate for that and help um, move the dog along. But that injury to that one leg does affect the entire dog in some way. So that's kind of what, what we get at with the legs concept, with the legs lens, is that we have four pillars, the legs. We have the learning history of the dog, the environment the dog is experiencing, the genetics of dog and the self, the kind of inner personality, inner workings of the dog. And those four pillars hold up the dog and keep it balanced and healthy. And when one of those pillars is affected or injured or damaged in some way, um, or isn't working properly in the proper environment, then we need to um, adjust the other three legs to try and help compensate for that um, that change in the legs. So that's where the concept of the legs framework got its name. Um, kind of when we're looking at dog behavior, we are looking at an antecedent, the stimulus that causes the behavior to happen, and then the behavior itself. And then we have some consequence to the behavior, what happens afterwards, what is the response. Um, so thinking of um, the mailman coming to the door, the mailman comes up on the step, he rings the doorbell, that's the antecedent, the mailman approaching the doorbell, that's the stimulus. The behavior, the dog barks. The consequence is the mailman goes away. And so if that was the dog's um, goal and the mailman goes away, then he's gonna keep barking every time the doorbell rings and the mailman comes because it worked. Um, so what we've kind of started to get into with dog training is sometimes we try to get too focused on exactly what happened immediately before the behavior, and then we'll just fix that thing. And then it'll be okay, it'll be taken care of. And we forget about all of the things lying beneath that initial or that immediate antecedent, which are part of what we call the legs or the antecedent iceberg. And that is what legs are. It's all of the things that come together that cause a behavior in our dog. So we've got the learning, the environment, the genetics, and the self. And all of those come together and act as antecedents to cause a behavior. And if we can understand why the dog is doing it, then we can better address the behavior in a more appropriate manner. Um, so the first of the legs is learning. So learning is everything that your dog will learn over his entire lifetime, what he has already learned, what he is learning right now and what he has yet to learn. And keep in mind that your dog is learning, learning is happening all day, every day, every second of the day, and your dog may not be learning what you think he's learning or what you want him to learn. So an example that I'll come back to in a minute is my dogs have learned from working in my home office that when I go, all right, and I close the lid of my laptop, we're done working for the day. And they do one more party break and then we're, and then we're done, we go to bed. And so they have learned as soon as I close my laptop lid, they're all up and going, whoop, where are we going? We're ready to go. Work's done. We're ready to do something else. And so that is something that they learned, a pattern that they learned that mm, maybe I don't want them to learn that. 
Um, so in what ways does learning happen? Um, lots of different ways it happens during socialization. So puppy socialization during those six to 16 weeks of, of um, development, they learn lots of things. And they, depending on what they're exposed to, what they're not exposed to, it was it a good experience, was it a bad experience, they'll learn from that. Um, training, what cues we train them, what we forget to train them, how we trained it. That's going to affect the learning history. Patterns that the dogs have learned. Patterns, pa or dogs are excellent at learning patterns and picking up on patterns like closing the lid of your laptop. Um, positive rewards, negative consequences, past and future events, and then trauma. Trauma is a huge effector of learning behavior and behavior in our dogs. So learning is more than just a cue, than teaching a cue. Learning is the key to a dog's ability to adapt to changes, to make predictions, and to anticipate events based on prior experience. So it's how they learn what's going to happen. So they do a lot of investigating if then, you know, kind of things. Well, that worked, that didn't work, that's scary or that's harmful. What is safe? What is trustworthy? Which human behaviors or patterns indicate that it's time for a go for a walk, time to eat, time to be left alone in the house. Carrie closes her laptop lid and it's time to be done with work and we're going to go do something else. Um, which words ask for a particular behavior and which words or sounds mean that a behavior or that a reward is coming or that maybe a punishment is coming. So lots of things that they're learning in their day-to-day -day existence. Our environment is everything that your dog has, is, or will encounter and or interact with over the course of his lifetime. So that's a big thing. So what he does or doesn't know about his environment creates both questions and answers. So if, if a dog is brand new to an environment and he's new to your home or new to a space and he doesn't know what's going on, he's gonna start wondering, am I safe? What is happening? What do I do? What do I do in this case? But if he knows some things and he's familiar with the environment, then he's going to say, oh, I know, I know what this is. I know it's safe or I know it isn't safe. I know what's happening. I know what to do here. So environment and learning really are paired together and linked together very heavily. What makes up a dog's environment? We've got our climate, weather, seasons, et cetera. We've got um, family and friends. We've got safety and security. Um, we have our daily lifestyle. Give me one second. My my old girl is taking offense to somebody. Um, excuse us. Um, time, amount of time in nature, amount of time in confinement, their home, you know, where do you live? What kind of, um, where do you take them for walks, trails, et cetera? Um, housemates, human, animals, exercise, enrichment, all of those things count as part of their environment and they're all learning from that. So a dog uses what he has learned in one environment to help him adapt and predict what might happen in another environment, right? So we just talked about that. And our job is to control the environment to keep it safe and make sure that it provides the things that will meet our dog's needs. So in general, we kind of think of as family dog mediators to manage the environment, not the dog right? Genetics. Genetics is going to be kind of a big topic today because we're going to look at the different genetic groups of dogs. But in general, genetics is all of the information about life that each of our dogs has arrived on earth with that's already encoded in their DNA. So they come locked and loaded. Genetics is not predictive, right? So it's not going to determine exactly what your dog is going to be and what he's going to do but it creates the possibilities and the limitations for each organism. So if you were to do a DNA kit and you were, you had a dog who loved fetch. And so you were absolutely sure you were going to see Labrador retriever in the genetics. That's treating genetics as if it is a predictive behavior that you can count on the genetics to tell you exactly what's going to happen. Instead, you need to frame, reframe that and think, here's my DNA. And you look at it and you say, oh, it's laboratory retriever, retriever. That's why my dog likes to play fetch. So it is not predictive. It just creates possibilities. 
So what does it include? It includes the basic instructions of how to be a dog. So chasing, hunting, barking, sniffing, digging, chewing, all of those things that make a dog a dog. It includes the specific traits that we selected for for thousands of years to create each particular breed and breed group. So the appearance, the size, the behaviors, you know, herding, retrieving, pointing, guarding, all of those things that we have artificially selected for. And it also includes um, the learning that took place in your dog's ancestors or parents that is then passed on to them or to future generations through their DNA. So it's all stuff that's encoded in their body. And it's all stuff that when we get looking at the leg structure, this is the pillar that we have very, very little wiggle room with in working with. So kind of in general, we cannot change the genetics of the dog in front of us, but we can change his learning experiences, control and manage his environment and nurture his self to help support and offset his genetics, right? So your dog comes loaded with certain characteristics and then we can use the other three legs to offset and support um, those genetics that he came with. Um, before we go into the different breeds or the breed groups, um, I want to just do a really quick kind of run through the timeline of a dog, just so we've kind of got an idea of when these things were happening. So depending on who you talk to and who you read, somewhere between 44,000 and 13,000 years ago, the first dogs appear. So the first dogs meet up with, with humans and they become, start to partner with each other, start to form a relationship. Somewhere around 5,000, 7,000 BC, we start seeing that sight hounds were being used for hunting in Egypt and in the Middle East. So as early as seven to 5,000 BC, we were already selecting and artificially creating different breed groups. Um, between 1500 and 1000 BC, we see dogs appearing in Re Re Greco-Roman history as guard dogs, herding dog, or excuse me, hunting dogs, dogs of war, so our big, huge um, molosser type dogs. Um, we had the Celtics at the same time were using these big dogs to trail scents to track game in around 700 to 400 BC. So we're getting a little bit closer to AD time period. We start seeing the first water dogs appearing in artwork. And these are the, what are thought to be the foundations of the gun dogs. So the retrievers, um, those type of dogs. In 55 BC, when the Romans were coming over to what is now the British Isles, they brought over herding dogs and those dogs mated with local dogs that created a kind of the collie type of land race or species that was created in the British Isles. Um, as we move into AD in 1100, where we actually see that dogs were truly being used to drove, to move cattle in the British Isles. And then in the Renaissance stage, so from around 1300 to 1800, in that Renaissance stage where we saw the explosion of art and culture in our world, we also saw an explosion of dog breeds and dog groups coming in. So this is where we started to see the terrier type dogs that were brought in to vermin, for vermin control. We started seeing water and land sp spaniels appearing in artwork. Um, toy breeds were pop becoming popular amongst the nobility. Um, the first scent hounds were being developed in Belgium. Pointers and retrievers are appearing in artwork. And then we have the bulldogs being developed at, in that time period. So that Renaissance stage, which is now, um, you know, 100 years ago, or excuse me, 1,000 years ago, um, almost, is um, kind of when we saw this explosion of these dogs coming into existence. So all of these different breed groups have a long history of performing the work that we created for them. Um, and then we have in 1900, the herding breeds were starting to get kind of split a little bit where some of them were getting pulled out and being specialized more by the military and police. So your Malinois, German Shepherds, um, Dobermans, those were being pulled out and um, specialized more for um, uh, crowd control or um, people control kind of stuff. And then um, kind of what's happening today where we are still creating a few breeds, you know, the, the doodle craze and 
um, honing skills and stuff. But if we look back at kind of when these dogs came into existence and what is happening in our culture right now, we can kind of see that most of these dogs no longer um, have an option to work the job that they were originally um, created for, which is where we start running into some behavior problems. Um, so when we kind of look at just in nature, and I'm just going to zip through this quickly, just so you kind of understand where artificial selection kind of came in. Um, just in nature, species in general will change and evolve over time based on the, their ability to be successful within a given habitat. And success is measured by, can you pass your genes on to the next generation, right? And so what is incorporated in that is your ability to stay alive long enough to transfer your genes to reproduce. So you've got, can you feed yourself through foraging? Can you keep yourself alive by, by avoiding hazards? And can you reproduce? And those three things kind of come together to create or, or um, eliminate certain species in certain habitats. Um, and um, where we've kind of messed with the genetics in dogs if we, as we have selected for things that we liked for in those three areas. When we look specifically at the foraging, because we have messed quite a bit with the predator or the um, predatory sequence in dogs, <clears throat> which is part of the foraging behavior and how they acquire their food. So the predatory sequence is just a series of patterns that dogs perform that one thing triggers the next, triggers the next, triggers the next. And it's really for, it's kind of um, an automatic sequence where um, if you have been going to the same job every day for 15 years, you get in your car in the morning and you turn on the radio and you start to drive. And the next thing you know, you're pulled up, you'll pull up in the parking lot and you're thinking, geez, I don't even remember driving to work. That's a sequence that you have created. And, and generally what they, they are for is just to kind of save on time. If you had to stop and think about everything that you did, you just wouldn't have enough time in the day to do it all. So the predatory sequence in dogs is, you know, first is orient. They look around to see, is there something out there that they might be able to hunt? Um, they'll eye it, kind of watch it and look at it and see, you know, which way is it going? Is it close to its den? Is it coming my direction? Do I have a chance of catching it? You know, and if they decide, yeah, you know, I think I might try and catch it. They'll go into the stock mode in general, where they're kind of hunched down and kind of quietly trying to get closer to increase their chances of catching it. Um, then we've got the chase behavior of, you know, chase after it. If we catch it, we've got, we grab onto it, bite it to hold onto it. Then we bite it to kill it. And then we dissect it and consume it. And that may seem icky, but that is the way that animals feed themselves in the wild. So some of what we see in the dogs we have now are based on what we've done with that sequence. Um, artificial selection in general is based on what works best for us and what we would like to see our dogs doing, not what works best for the animal. So problem behaviors generally don't happen in nature because either nature selects against them and a dog that is not performing what it needs to do in its habitat is not going to, it's either not going to live or it's not going to pass on those genes. Um, or an animal is simply having all its needs met in its environment. So there, it's, there's no problem behaviors to be had. Um, a behavior becomes maladaptive or what we would be call problematic when behaviors that we artificially selected for are no longer benefiting the animal, either behaviorally, environmentally, psychologically, adaptively, or, you know, for the current animal circumstances. And that's kind of where we're at today with we've got all these jobs that we created or dogs that we created jobs for, and then we kind of disappeared all the jobs with today's um, uh, culture. So now these dogs are left wondering, what do I do? So we've got these 10 genetic breed groups. Um, they're very similar to the AKC groups with some um, changes. These are based on, um, Kim Brophy put these together in her Meet Your Dog book and they are based on their um, genetic origin 
and um, they're ordered in kind of how they came to be. Um, so we've got the, the sight hounds, the guardians, the bulldogs, the herding dogs, the terriers, the scent hounds, the world dogs, the natural dogs, the gun dogs, and the toy dogs. And we'll go through those. Um, before we start on those, so what I wanted to mention was we kind of look at dogs as we've got this mantra of it's all how you raise them. You know, any dog can be anything as long as you raise them right. And to be perfectly honest, that is that that isn't possible. Um, you can have the best trained little Shih Tzu in the world, but it's never going to be a police dog. It's never going to win any awards for bite work or Shih Tzu because it's it's not created to do those things. So they're kind. Dogs are kind of like balls. Dogs are dogs. Balls are balls. Balls roll. They all kind of look the same, but we've created different balls for different sports. And we kind of understand this if we're playing soccer and somebody pops the soccer ball and somebody comes out and said, here, let's try this one. And they bring out a bowling ball. We're going to find out really quickly that all balls are not created equally and they're, they're not all meant to do the same job. So dogs are kind of the same way in that form follows function. And in the second group we look at, we'll look at a, um, a real definite um, example of how form follows function whenever you create a function for something, it develops or, or ends up with the perfect form um, for that job. So um, most of these dogs, everything I've pulled out of here comes out of the meet your dog information. And um, you can find all that in there. So I'm going to zip through these kind of quickly because I've got a lot of stuff to cover today. So the first group we're going to look at is the natural dogs. These are the basically the first dogs, the kind of the first form of selection that we did um, way back in 1300, 4400 BC. So this group is going to maintain the most the most primary traits, and they're going to be the least specialized of all the groups. So you've got your husky types, your um, spitz types, the elk hounds, the basenjis, the akitas, the shiba inus. Those ones are all part of this natural group. Their historical job um, was really kind of beginning the partnership with humans. So, you know, dogs came along and they were hanging around on the outskirts of an encampment and people would come in and the dogs would bark and people who lived there are like, oh, wow, that's an alert system. We could, we could use that. So they started to partner with dogs as being, you know, I'll feed you and if, and if you hang around and kind of let me know when people are coming. Dogs track and hunt things. Oh, well, if you track it down, I'll shoot it and we'll share it. So that's kind of where they kind of um, met together and kind of started to build that relationship. So in that world, those dogs saw prey as a hunting opportunity versus today where we don't have prey animals in town. So they start to see small animals as a possible hunting opportunity as just a side effect of what of being a dog. Um, in general, they kind of socially, they have less fear and aggression towards humans than a, than a wolf would have, but they still maintain a definite wariness towards novel objects, novel people. They have a definite sense of self-preservation and that affects kind of the quote unquote problem behaviors that we see in these dogs. So things you might struggle with, obviously predatory behavior, wandering off, escaping. Some of these dogs are total escape artists because they want to get out and wander around. That's what they're, that's what they're created to do. Difficult to recall. They have a hard time being confined. They don't like to be crated. They don't like to be handled. All of that's due to that natural wariness and stuff. Sometimes destructive behavior in the house. You know, if they're not comfortable hanging out in the house in a crate all day, they get bored and they get destructive. You know, resource guarding, independent nature in that they have a mind of their own, not in that excuse me, they're hard to train, they're stupid, they're stubborn, anything like that. It's that I'd like to do it my way. I have my own agenda, you know, thank you very much. And so we find that difficult. We're at odds with that. Um, some of the things that, that they need or can benefit from, opportunities to quote unquote predate. So playing predation games, um, flirt pole, those kind of things. Um, a good fence. If you're going to have a dog, you're going to have to be able to contain them. So if you have an escape artist, you'd need to make sure you've got a good fence. Um, and then kind of things that all dogs really we need to be aware of. 
and these guys are a little more needy of that kind of thing is they all have a personal space bubble, right? Not all every dog wants you right in their face, hugging them and cuddling them. They have in a personal personal space bubble. We need to acknowledge that. Um, they benefit from cooperative care. Instead of just brushing up with a brush and thinking to myself, I've got 15 minutes to get this dog brushed and just going at it, they're going to take offense to that. So some cooperative care, talking to them, I'm it's time to brush and and saying, you know, instead of in 15 minutes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to brush them this week and just let the dog have a, have the choice to opt out when it wants to. Offering the dog some choice and consent, right? Do you want to go left or right at the corner? Do you want this treat or that treat? Can I pet you? Nope. Okay. Well, that's fine. I'll go away. All dogs benefit from time in nature. And then these guys really benefit from building up trust because they are naturally more wary than other dogs. So just building up trust with them is very helpful. Um, enrichment ideas. So when we're talking about enrichment, um, as far as enrichment activity, um, it's all about the inv individual dog. So there are some things that we think, yeah, that breed of dog probably would like that. They maybe do, maybe don't. So just try out different things. If your dog likes it, run with it. If they don't, don't do it anymore. Um, but some of the things these dogs might like is destruction boxes. So, you know, taking a cardboard box, throwing some treats in, closing it up and let them rip it up. Or if they're really good at that, taking multiple like cereal boxes and putting them inside each other and in between the layers, put some treats in there. And then they've really got a, a more difficult thing that they need to dismantle. Um, and it really gets to that kind of dissecting need that they tend to have. Um, a lot of dogs love scatter feeding, just throwing food out on the grass. It really gets them that foraging need and sniffing. Um, more focused nose work where they're actually focusing on finding something particular. Um, barn hunt, which um, most people have heard of that. It's basically a, they have a rat in a tube that's been conditioned. There's no rats harmed in the making of this game. They'll hide it in a barn somewhere and the dogs, the object is to find the rat. Um, tug and flirt pole. Um, any game you teach a dog, make sure that everybody knows the rules. Um, that's generally kind of the misnomer of tug and that it makes the dog more aggressive. If they like tug, they get really excited about tug. And if you don't tell them you need to wait until I'm ready, as soon as you get out the tug rope, they're going to be jumping all over the place trying to grab it. So you just, like every game, you teach them the rules. You need to sit for a second until it's until I'm ready. Get it means get it. We need to teach you when to drop it. And then importantly, we need to teach you when the game's over. You know, so I teach my dog a all done, all done cue. Um, tracking, sniff walks, puzzle toys, um, parkour is the only other one you might not know about. And that is um, urban agility. So the finding objects out on your walk for dogs to climb up or over or under. Um, this one, I would just caution you that if you have a dog who is an escape artist, I wouldn't go out and practice um, stump climbing and things like that if you have a tree in your yard that they're going to then use to escape. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, scent hounds. So Afghans, greyhounds, borzois, those. Um, we're seeing these back as early as 7,000 BC in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, so we selected these guys to be able to look out on the horizon and see a prey animal and then just go after it. And so as we continue to select more for better peripheral vision for that scanning, they developed this longer, more elongated, narrow um, skull formation, which is form follows function kind of a deal. So their historical job was seeing prey at a great distance and then just going at it with great speed and chasing it down. So again, rabbit moving along the horizon, I see it and I go. Neighbor's cat out in the yard, I see it and I go, right? So we really manipulated the scanning, looking for things. We kind of eliminated the taking the time to watch it and stock it and just went all in to see it and go. And so um, these dogs still have some wariness. They um, are a little bit less, less wary than the, than the previous group, but they still have some wariness. They still have some self-preservation. They will still um, predate on things. 
things that you might struggle with. Um, predatory behavior, obviously, recalls running off after critters. So you've got to keep these guys safe. Most of your sight hounds, if they see something, they're just going to go. They're a run first, think later. So you want to make sure that they are safe, whether it's in a big confined area or on a long line, something like that. Um, some of them are not great with handling. Um, some of them can be super sensitive. Um, you know, so uh, a loud voice can can be, you know, worse than than hitting the dog. Some of them are very sensitive. Um, again, they are still somewhat independent and again, resource guarding. And we'll see resource guarding in all dogs, all animals resource guard. So what kind of things do these dogs need? They do need an opportunity to run and chase. They, you know, they do need that. They need time in nature. They need a good fence or a long line to keep them safe. Enrichment ideas, along with all the other things you can try, <clears throat> excuse me, Lure coursing seems to be really built for them. Where you've got like a decoy that you're moving around a field and the dog is chasing after trying to catch it. Or just, you know, running around out in open spaces. The guardians. Um, so these are the, they came from the molosser type dogs that dated back at least to 1100 B.C., um, these are those dogs that we see the huge gentle giants that, you know, the sheep and the goats on TikTok are climbing all over. Um, these in, in our case are divided into the livestock guardian type and the mastiff type. So you've got the like the Pyrenees, uh, Marima Shepherd type dogs that are living with sheep and taking care of them. And then you have the more mastiffy type dogs like the Coney Corsos. Um, so lots of different breeds um, included in here. Historically, their job was to guard. So you can expect them to guard. They're, they were meant to guard, protect, and defend livestock and property. Some of them were used for cart dogs. Um, and that was just kind of opportunity. If you had a cart and you needed to move stuff to town and you didn't have a horse and you didn't have an ox, but you had a really big dog, you attached the dog onto the cart and they became cart dogs. Um, they were used, there is evidence that they were used by the Romans in some of their gladiator sports. They were used as dogs of war because they were so big. Um, so they did, they were bred to treat predators and intruders as a threat to territory and react to that. Think today of people who have an open door policy of friends and family coming and going as they please and how that is going to be viewed by a dog whose learning history is certain intruders shouldn't be coming in here, right? And so we kind of bred them to be, have less animosity and agonistic behaviors and increased tolerance of handling and stuff with their social flock. So with their family and their flock but to have increased wariness and agonistic behavior towards intruders. So these dogs kind of are very much a, um, they know who belongs and they know who doesn't belong. And they're going to have a, 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 something to say about those who don't belong and whether or not they should be allowed to enter. Um, in general, predatory sequence, they kind of don't have any, because if you're going to have a dog living with livestock, you, you can't have them eating your livestock. So what do we see? Recalls, roaming, um, they will, and we'll talk about that in, in a second here, as they, um, they do kind of roam and they do acquire territory um, as they roam around. So we'll talk about that in one of our case studies. Um, again, difficulty with confinement, restraint, handling, wariness of strange people and other dogs and resource guarding and aggression. All of that because we created them to live with a flock of sheep outside and protect them and bringing them into the house is just against what we taught them to do, what we bred them to do. Um, independent nature, they do um, sometimes have some social conflict, especially with the same sex. So if you have a two or three year old Great Pyrenees male who's in the house with another two or three year old male Great Pyrenees, you may see some conflict between the dogs. Um, they are all dogs are crepuscular, but these guys are definitely very active in the morning and the evening when predators are active. 
and they're very much snoozy and relaxing with the flock during the day. The other thing to think about these dogs is they are very deliberate in what they do. And it's not only in how quick they, quickly they react, but in how quickly they listen. So if, you know, if the mailman's coming to your house and he's sitting on the porch, he's going to bark and say, yeah, no, you don't belong. And the mailman keeps coming. So he might stand up and bark. And if the mailman keeps coming, then he'll step off the porch and bark. So he's very kind of slow to advance into a rah, 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 kind of a thing. Um, so they're more deliberate. And I think things through a little bit more than some of the other dogs do. But that also lends to thinking through when you ask them to do something. So when you ask them to sit, they're going to think through what you've asked them to do. And then they've got to gather up all that big dogness they have and get themselves configured into a sit position. So one of the things that they need is a little bit of patience with us. You know, they're not going to be like a Malinois that's just going to sit on a dime. They're going to be slower and more deliberate about it. The other thing that they really, really need is some sort of a vantage point. I mean, that is almost a mandatory welfare issue if one of these dogs does not have the ability to kind of scan its environment and watch what's going on. So that's one of the big kind of enrichment things is giving them opportunities to watch the world go by. We got the toy dogs, so all the littles. Um, most of them are dwarf versions of dogs from other groups. So some of their behaviors come from, from that. Um, they're kind of the original pet dog. They were bred to be a lap dog. So we shrunk them down so that they could live in the lap of luxury, right? They were bred to be a lap dog. They were a lap warmer flea magnet alarm system for um, a lot of people who had time and money on their hands back in the medieval and renaissance area era. Um, and they had these dogs sitting on their lap and they were an alert system. If someone was sneaking around, that dog alert, bark, 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 and let them know someone was coming. And so again, what do they do now that kind of blows over into they see somebody mowing their lawn and they alert, oh my God, there's somebody coming to kill us. Um, we've selected them for them for dependency on humans. We've selected them for um, juvenile characteristics is what neoteny means. So they're really cute and little and they stay looking cute and little. Increased response to threats. So they are very much alert barkers. What you might see, obviously, excessive barking. And that can often be very hard to control. Um, house training challenges, kind of for two reasons. We have a dog that is little and has a very little bladder. And we have a dog who was selected for juvenile characteristics and that Sometimes some believe that that house training difficulty comes along with that. I don't know if that's how accurate that is, but that is an explanation for why house training seems to be more of a challenge with the littles. Um, separation anxiety, resource guarding, aggression, awareness of strange people, intolerance of handling by strangers, all of that goes to this is my person, I live on their lap, and this is my job to be here and alert and protect them, right? Some of these dogs you will see have noise phobia, and that again comes along with the juvenile characteristics. So sometimes when you select for a certain thing in genetics, other things that you didn't necessarily want come along with it. And um, noise phobia seems to be um, a result of selecting for those more juvenile characteristics. Um, what does this group need? What we need to teach them is that there is life outside of a person's lap. So getting them out, teaching them how to be a dog, giving them dog time, um, playing, rolling around in the grass and teaching them some independence is really healthy for these guys. Um, then we've got the hound dogs, the scent hounds. Um, so they are, you know, the coon hounds, the fox hounds. <coughs> They're known for their marking and baying. They're very definitely a kind of act now, think later kind of a guy. Um, they were bred for obviously hunting and tracking. Um, as far back as 1000 BC, the Celts were using dogs for tracking. 
Um, so we've got, we located target prey on a hunt and we take off after it and start baying versus today I'm out on a walk. I see a squirrel and what am I bound to do? Right. So it kind of, again, bleeds over into what we consider problem behaviors. Um, Increased affiliation and cooperation towards humans, right? We're spending more time with them, doing more things with them instead of um, them doing it themselves. Um, definitely increased the, the need to search. And we kind of replaced the, the watching and stalking with the mark. So the mark is that, woo, woo. You know, I found a, I thought it sounded more like a fire engine, but I found a, a a prey and I'm off to get it. So they kind of re use that mark to replace that. What do you see? Excessive barking. It's easy to get them to bark. Recall, you know, they're off running and chasing and following their nose. It's going to be hard to get them to come back. So again, safety first. You may need to use long lines and stuff on these guys. Got to be careful about them running off. So make sure that you've got a fence yard or a long line or something on them, unless you've got them very well trained for a recall. Um, some predatory behavior, obviously, leash, leash frustration. Um, sometimes they can be hard to control on a leash if they see a squirrel and they want to go after it, right? Um, and again, some difficulty with confinement because these guys were still used to being housed outside and used to big wide open spaces. Um, so kind of some things that they they need. They need the opportunity to sniff. They need the opportunity to bark. You can't just tell a dog you can never bark again. They need the opportunity to use their nose and sniff things and track things. Um, if the predatory behavior is, is really out of hand and is becomes a safety concern, um, Simone Mueller is a trainer out of Germany and she's got a great um, uh, technique for predation substitution training where we teach the dogs to watch the prey and only use a portion of that um, predatory sequence by watching the animal and then we help them um, finish the sequence. And so if that's an issue, that's a really great resource is to look her stuff up. Then we have the gun dogs. So these are the hunting dogs, so the pointers, the spaniels, the retrievers, all of those guys. Um, kind of the first family dogs because these guys were definitely they're no longer a, you go track down the animal and I'll come and shoot it. These are definitely a working in close communication and close cooperation with their human. You know, so we've got, um, I'm just going to go to this next page. We've really started to fiddle with the prey sequence in these dogs where we've really highlighted the first bit of it where we've got them searching, we've got them orienting and, and eyeing things. And we've added long pauses in between these maneuvers so that we can give them instructions. So we've got these dogs who will point at something and stand there forever, it seems, just frozen staring at game in order for us to creep up on it and shoot it. We've got a pause before they go chase something so we can shoot it. And then we, the dog waits and we tell it to go in and get it. So we've got all of this cooperation in there. And it takes a long time to train these dogs to do that. So way back in the day, they didn't want to leave these dogs outside in the barn or, you know, where something might get them or somebody might steal them. So they started bringing them in the house, not to keep the people safe, but to keep the dog from being stolen. So they had to start becoming more, you know, used to being around people and much more um, uh, selective towards being friendly and, and more social with people. Um, so. When they are hunting, they're very much looking for hunting instructions from their human hunting partner. When they don't have a hunting partner, they're seeking attention and instructions from any human. They just want to be social. They're very social, social animals. At the other end of that prey sequence, we really dumb down the kill, bite, dissect, and consume, right? If you got a dog that's going to retrieve something, you need them to pick it up with a very gentle mouth and bring it back to you without damaging it or eating it. So problems you might see, um, very, very social, you know, overwhelming greetings, too much attention seeking, very distractible and, and impulsive, just all of that built into the more social, more juvenile characteristics, again, that we built into these dogs. 
And we built in an absolute massive oral fixation with a lot of these dogs, like the retrievers, right? They've got, they're used to having something in their mouth. And so they can be, especially as puppies, more destructive while they're exploring things with their mouth. So things that they need because of that oral fixation, definitely management, right? You can't just leave your shoes lying around with any puppy, but you really can't leave your shoes lying around with a baby retriever because they're just going to explore everything with their mouth. They need a lot of human social contact. They need a lot of activity, a lot of play. They're up for just about anything. You can get these dogs doing just anything in the realm of enrichment. So again, um, you know, the world's your oyster as long as your dog enjoys doing it and it's safe. Terriers. Um, so these guys, terrier comes from the French um, word terra, which means earth. So these are earth dogs. They are meant to dig. Their prey was underground for the most part. Um, so some of these dogs are considered to be what they call courageous to the point of insanity or hashtag no filter dog, right? So this picture over here on the side shows some little tiny dachshund type dogs attacking a badger. So these dogs were created to to get rid of vermin, to get rid of badgers, fox, rats, etc., and often to climb down holes after them. So courageous, courageous to the point of sanity and no filter dog lends into that. If you have a little 10 pound dachshund and you want it to go down a hole after a badger, you cannot have a dog that's going to stop and wonder if that's a good idea. You have to have a dog who just has no filter. I see it and I go for it. And so that's really what we built into these dogs. Um, and they were definitely used for vermin control. So they came about once we started really becoming farmers and, and storing grain and stuff where we had rats and mice. And so we wanted these animals to control the mice and stuff. And so the goal wasn't catch a mouse and eat it. The goal was you're in the barn. If there's a hundred mice in here, I want you to kill a hundred mice as fast as you can. So as awful it may, as it may sound, what we did with these dogs is create a dog that is just a find it, grab it, shake it, kill it, toss it and go for the next one. So just get rid of them as quick as you can, because you're, they're, they're, they were a vermin trap, right? And so all of this led into I, there's an altercation with a rat in a barn and I'm going to go after it. What happens now when you have a terrier and they discover you have a pet hamster in the house, right? You can't let that pet hamster be running around when Fluffy the Jack Russell Terrier is out roaming the house unless you have worked with some other parts of the dog's legs and helped them acclimate to that little hamster. So problems that we see, again, predatory re behavior, resource guarding, competitiveness, bossiness, independent. We bred them to be little feisty, you know, contentious little guys, right? I'm going to go get it and do it. And I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go get that big thing, right? We bred them not to be afraid of big things. Um, sometimes that leads to some fixating and stereotypical activity where, um, uh, Kim um, had a, a story of a, a client that she worked with who had a little terrier who was fixating on the walls of the house and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And they discovered there were mice in the walls that the, the terrier could hear and smell. And it was just driving him buggy. He was trying to get at it. Um, so you see some of those kind of behaviors. Again, least frustration if they can't get to what they want. And most definitely an act before you think kind of a guy. So what do we have in what do they need? We've got to give these guys an opportunity to dig. If you've got a little terrier and you're just, you know, out and about, it got a great, beautiful yard and you're like, no way is that dog going to dig in my yard. That almost becomes a bit of a welfare concern for that dog if he's never allowed to dig because they are so built on being a digging type of dog. So we need to come up with some way for them to meet those needs. A lot of play, time in nature, all those things. Predation substitute training can be an option. A lot of enrichment ideas. They're up for just about everything. Um, they're very active, happy little dogs. 
Then we have the Bulldogs. So we've got the um, Staffordshire Terrier, the Boxers, Bull Mastiff, English Bulldog, French Bulldog, Pit Bull, Terrier, etc. cetera. Um, these were created by crossing the big guardian dogs with a terrier. Um, and the reason that was done is early on, it was thought, and, and I, someone may correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I have read, the, um, at the time, it was thought that if you kind of riled up and got an animal to do some activity before you butchered it, it made the meat taste better. And so they would get these dogs who would rile up these cows and stuff and get them active and kind of fighting a little bit before they would butcher them and the meat would taste better. And again, you've got a thousand pound bull and you've got a 50 pound dog. So you need to have some characteristics in that dog that is going to make what you want happen, happen. So you need a bigger dog. You need a strong dog. And most of these dogs in this breed group are amazingly strong for their size. And you need a bit of a terrier. You need some tenacity in there where they're not going to think, oh my God, that bull is humongous. I'm not going to go after that. Right. And so that's where it started. And then of course, in human nature, we, you know, bastardized it with, you know, making it into a game. And um, so what we see in these dogs is they're fabulous dogs. They are social. They are friendly. They are lovable. They are goofy. They are up for anything, but they are very easily are aroused and go over threshold. And we kind of built that into them. We aroused them into going off and going after a bull. So we have to watch what we're doing in play. And it can be as simple as watching for the dog to begin to get overexcited and then just stopping the game and helping the dog learn how to react, relax. So controlling their emotions is kind of a big deal with these dogs. They can be a bit of a crapshoot for what you're going to kind of get as far as behaviors, because some of them have a bit, a little bit more of the terrier tendency, and some of them have a little bit more of the guardian tendency. So you may or may not see predatory behavior. You may or may not see protective or territorial aggression, may or may not see resource guarding. Um, you may or may not see leash reactivity. Um, this one, this group is kind of uh, really a coin flip of unless you really know the line of what you're getting, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what that dog is going to be like. But they are fabulous, fabulous dogs. If you have um, an understanding that you do need to have some control over their emotional regulation. And that's mainly because they may not start a fight, but they are the stronger dog. And that that's, unfortunately for them, that is the ugly truth of it. So things that they like to do, they most of them and most dogs in general like to rip things up. So destruction boxes, they love to play, they love activities. And then again, teaching them the rules of a game and then just teaching them some emotional regulation. With any dog, when you see a dog getting overwrought and overexcited where they can't even pay attention to you anymore, you've got them too ramped up. And so what you need to do is learn how to recognize that the dog is getting overexcited and then just taking a break. And that's generally how dogs play. They play for a little bit and then they take a break and then they play for a little bit and then they take a break. And we tend to want to play, 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 play until somebody in the room is not having fun anymore and then everybody leaves mad. And we just need to take on the way that dogs play with one another, where we play a little bit and then we take a break. Um, herding dogs, lots of those again. Um, so they have been instinctually given a need to manage chaos, which comes out as I need to control all the things, right? They are absolute masters of behavior chains and patterns. And man, they've got a memory for patterns like you can't believe. So these guys, you've got to be super careful about what you're teaching them that they don't think 15 steps ahead of you as to what's going to happen next. Um, huge variety. They are active in sports and all kinds of things. We've got our police and military dogs as well. And we've got our dogs that are still out on the farm herding sheep and doing what they were meant to do. 
Um, so again, how far back they truly go, I don't know. Um, there is evidence that they were um, in the uh, British Isles, what is now the British Isles, around 55 BC, being used to control livestock. Um, and again, some breeds were specialized for um, using in more kind of military or kind of crowd control kind of things, just because they want to control everything. They're good at, you know, putting all the all the things in a row. Um, my one Australian shepherd in the summer goes out and she herds my goldfish. They're, the goldfish have the audacity to go out to the edges of the pond and she runs around and herds them. And once they're in the middle, she'll stand and watch them. And as soon as one starts to bolt for the side, she runs over and herds it back to the middle. Um, so they just have this need to control chaos. And that be, can become really difficult for them and for their families, right? So what they're bred to do is look for sudden changes in flock behavior and control it. And so some of that we control, right? We are controlling, you know, come by, wait to me, slow down, go around, all the things that the, the sheep herder is asking them to do and moving the stock. But sometimes when they're left to their own devices, they're also asked to keep the sheep in this space. And then it's their job to watch 400 sheep. And if sheep number 397 flicks her ear and looks like she might be wanting to get up to go pee behind that bush, the dog is on it in an instant over there to, nope, not right now, you're in the flock. And so that works great when they're out herding sheep. But then we have them now today in homes with children, and there is nothing more unpredictable than a child. And, you know, truly that can blow a herding dog's mind that they can't predict what that child's going to do. And so that need to control kicks in. Um, hold on one second. I just locked my computer. That was good. Um, okay. So things you might struggle with. Um, a little bit of aggression. So they do kind of do the kind of charging to move things off. Um, some resource guarding, impulse control, chasing fast moving objects. That's the biggie. Chasing things and trying to control them. Um, excessive barking at things, hyperactivity, restlessness. And if they have nothing for their outlets, they can get what look like some OCD type behaviors. So they really need some outlets for that energy of being able to control things, whether it's herding opportunities or in my case, go out and herd goldfish all day if you want to. Um, and then also kind of helping them with some emotional regulation, helping them learn when it's a good time to kind of sit down and take a break. And then finally, we have the um, world dogs. So um, coming directly kind of out of the book, um, these are defined by Kim as any dog with no genetic group contributing 30% or more to their ancestry is or has returned to the true representation of a dog as nature has designed them the world over for thousands of years. Opportunistic scavenger of human leftovers, garbage and poop eating, professional human behavior, observers and manipulators. So these kind of come in two um, packages. One is if we look at all the dogs the world over, about 80% of them are not owned by anybody. They're street dogs, village dogs out roaming and doing their thing and just kind of on the outskirts or kind of in concert a little bit with humans, but not owned by anybody. And then we also have the dogs that are mixed breeds, that if you were to do a DNA test and you added up all of the um, breed group percentages in what you get for DNA, they are not represented by any particular breed group. So they kind of have a little bit of everything. And so what you see is kind of a lot of those um, selected for traits get muddled and watered down and they start getting back to what is really quintessentially what a dog was meant to be, right? And so when you look at these dogs, and, and I would, again, say any dog in general, dogs are, are created to be scavengers. They always have been. They see, would, would see things laying on the ground as something available to scavenge to eat for lunch. And so in the same vein, if you leave a peanut butter sandwich sitting on the table or on the coffee table, your dog is going to see that as something available to scavenge and bad on you for leaving it sitting there. You know, it's just something that 
your dog's going to do because he's a dog. Um, things that we have um, struggle with confinement and handling. Um, a lot of this is more related to when we start capturing and saving those stray street dogs and stuff and bringing them into the city. We are taking them out of um, a life that, that they know and they understand and putting them into a life that, that we think is better, but they don't understand. And so they, that ends up with a lot of these kind of issues with handling and confinement. But in general, you're gonna see a lot of just the normal, what we would call annoying dog behaviors, right? He's chewing on my stuff, he's jumping on the furniture, he's stealing food, he's afraid in the garbage can, da, da, da. Um, so in general, your general enrichment ideas, your general um, things that group needs. Um, if you don't have a DNA test um, on your dog and you would like to kind of at least understand what your dog's breed group is, um, the dog key that Kim has developed, um, you can find it on the dogkey.com, um, uses dog characteristics and will guide you through and help you um, determine your dog's major and minor um, dog breed groups. And you can kind of give it, get an idea and learn a little bit more about your dog that way. Um, there are some dogs that are kind of developed from two genetic groups. So, um, docks and stalmations, some of those are, um, are in that group. The reason I mention these is because they do tend to express characteristics from both of the breed groups or from all the breed groups that they're from. So it's a good idea to look at the different breed groups, just so you've got an idea about what the possibilities are. Um, I toss doodles in here. Not that they're a breed or a breed group, but because if you have a mixed breed dog, um, if you know what the breed groups are, you can kind of get an idea of kind of what should I look for in a mixed breed dog. So if you've got a doodle, half of it is gun dog. Poodles are gun dogs, they're retrievers. So look to the retrievers for some of the characteristics. If you've got an Aussie doodle or a sheep -a doodle, then they've got herding characteristics. If you've got a Bernadoodle, they've got guardian characteristics. And so you may see things like more um, resource guarding in a Bernadoodle or more territory guarding in a Bernadoodle because they've got a guardian breed mixed in there. Finally, we've got self. So this is all of the internal things that affect the dog. Um, so again, these are changing all the time. Um, kind of a neat way to think of this and um, I think it's a German word, Alexandra Horowitz re, uh, mentions it in her books, uh, the umwelt of a dog, which is the world as it is experienced by an individual organism, which is kind of like that organism's self. So what is self? It's kind of everything we haven't already mentioned, age, gender, reproductive status, weight, diet, health, pain, allergies, all of those different things. So because all of these things do affect your dog, Anytime I see a dog with behavior issues that someone says I'm having behavior problems, the first step should always be a visit to the vet to see if there's something medical before you start um, contacting a trainer or someone to try and fix those behaviors. So if we look at all the legs together and all the things that come packaged in our dogs and change on a day-to-day -day basis, we realize our dog is really a unique individual because of his legs. Every dog is a unique individual. And so the idea that puppies are a blank, blank slate is a total myth busted. They come carrying all of this stuff with them. Um, it's all how you raise them. Another myth, bu myth, myth busted because they have genetics that come with them and we can't deny that. So we cannot change the genetics of the dog in front of us, but we can change his learning experiences, control and manage his environment, and nurture his self to help support and offset his genetics. So this is kind of what we do as family dog mediators. What does a session look like for my clients? Um, first, we do a very detailed history taking. Our first session is an hour and a half, two hours long, where we talk about all the, you know, where did the dog come from? How long have you had the dog? 
um, you know, bite history, all the behaviors that you're having trouble with, what is the dog eating, are there any allergies, all of those things, very detailed history taking. We talk about the behaviors that were that are troubling, and we talk about what are the goals. Um, and we definitely talk about what is realistic and what isn't realistic for a particular dog. Then we move to outlining the legs of that dog. So, um, what you know, categorizing what is an L, what is an E, what is a G, while keeping in mind the human legs. And we'll talk about those in a second. Reframing problem behaviors in terms of the dog's needs versus the client's wants, right? Some of these things that we call problem behaviors are just dog traits, right? Dogs bark, dogs dig, dogs chew, dogs howl. You can't ask a dog never to do any of those things. That's like putting someone into solitary confinement with a blindfold and a, uh, um, you know, a, a muffler on their mouth so they can't speak. And, you know, so that is, that's a welfare issue to say you can't ever do those things again. So it's reframing understanding of, you know, the dog does need to do that. It doesn't need to bark for 20 minutes at the front door when the mailman comes. We can work on that, but you can't say you can never, ever bark again, right? Um, then we come up with a plan. So when when all my plans involve a lot of education, um, a lot of education, um, body language, dog traits, choice and control, all those kinds of things. Management. So again, managing the environment, not the dog when it's when it's possible to do that. Um, sometimes it's teaching new skills. And a lot of times it's compromise. You know, what are we compromising on and under, having some understanding that, you know, the dog does need to do that thing. And then there may be further discussion down the road or even that day on, um, you know, is the dog simply not the right fit for the environment or for the family? And then what is the next step for that? Um, is the client not willing to make changes, right? I don't, I don't have the, the ability to put up a baby gate between my child and my dog to keep my dog from biting my child. Okay, then we need to have further discussions about that. I don't, I personally do not use um, prong collars and shock collars. Um, if clients come to me who are currently using those, um, we talk about that and I never tell anybody you can't, you have to stop using that right now. But I do tell them my goal is to get rid of that, to try and work, you know, work to where we can get rid of that thing. Um, but I, I see a lot of clients who have invisible fences and that that's a oftentimes a non-starter. That's, that's just the way it is due to um, HMO regulations and stuff where they can't have a fence. So then we have to go back to the legs and see how we can support that with the other legs. And then finally, what if we can't make it safe? What if we have a dog that's biting or something and we can't make it safe either for the dog or for the person? And so we have to have a further discussion about that. Our clients also have their own legs. So I would say 75% of my business now is working with clients. I work with the county. Um, so I work with clients who have um, mental health, health, health diagnoses. I work with clients who have their own dog. And so um, we work as a team to um, help them meet their mental health goals in concert with their dog. So um, how, what can we learn from a dog about communication with other people by learning how to communicate with the dog? What can we learn about choice and consent with our own body or with other people by learning about choice and content, consent with our dog? Can we develop coping skills, et cetera, for anxiety with our dog? Um, so we got to keep in mind that clients have their own legs. If they've got a, a, ter a young terrier or a young Malinois or something that they're having trouble with, and they have three young kids, they may not have the spoons to do the entire training plan that you know would work. And so you have to be able to shift and understand that and work with them. Um, Dr. Chris Pockle has a fabulous quote. Everyone is doing the best that they can with the tools they have available in this moment. And if we add this to Maya Angelou's wonderful quote, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. And that is kind of my mantra of what I try to do with my clients. Um, so when looking at a dog's behavior and well-being, we must start with that unique individual sitting in front of us, the self, and then we work backwards through legs or um, genetics, environment, and learning, and then we identify and try to create the solution. So we look at the dog sitting in front of us, and then we work backwards. 
because the needs of a young male husky living in Alaska as part of a sled dog team are going to be different than the needs of an adolescent border collie living in an apartment complex in New York City, which are going to be different than a pregnant female village dog living on the streets of Peru. So we have to first start with the self. Um, and then we have to look at the fact that changes in our modern world have had drastic effects on our dogs' lives and their ability to meet their needs, right? Border collies are no longer, a lot of them don't have sheep to herd, but we don't let them herd kids or bikes. Terriers are no longer employed to keep vermin out of the barns, but killing our pet hamsters isn't acceptable. Um, Dalmatians were bred to run alongside carriages all day, every day. But now they're spending, you know, they may spend eight to 12 hours in a crate every day. Huskies once pulled sleds hundreds of miles across the Arctic tundra. We now have huskies living in Florida condos. So the behaviors that develop in these cases, we call problem behaviors because for us, they are a problem. But in fact, sometimes they are unmet needs. And sometimes they're unrealistic expectations, right? Who wants to have somebody petting you and rubbing you and patting your head and rubbing your face when you're trying to eat your dinner, right? That gets irritating. And, you know, dogs find that irritating. All of the dress up and the combing and the brushing and all that stuff that we want to do to pamper our dogs, our dogs often don't find that pampering. They find rolling in the mud and a pile of horse poop much more fun than going to get a bath. You know, when we go for walks, do you walk your dog with a short leash and they need to stay right by you? Or do you say, it's up to you, we'll go wherever you want to go, you know, or do you combine that, right? Or, you know, walk them on a short leash until you get to somewhere where they can get out and sniff. Lots of this hugging, kissing, cuddling stuff that dogs are just, you know, they've got a space bubble. They don't really enjoy that. So sometimes it's just un unrealistic expectations that get us in trouble with our dogs or get us our dogs in trouble with us. So I start my clients always off with canine body language, right? I teach them what their dog is trying to tell them. And I give them homework of here's what you need to work on. So all of these pictures are all different ways that the dog is trying to say, I'm not comfortable, please give me some space. Right. And so sometimes we don't hear them saying that until they bark and growl at us when a lot of these are just very subtle behaviors that we just don't take notice of. But once we notice them, then we notice them and we react to them. So that's the first thing I teach my clients. Then we talk about what is a dog? Right. What does a dog do? What, what makes a dog a dog? A dog sniffs. They play. They dig. They chase. They bark. They eat poop. They roll in poop. They growl. You know, once you start eliminating all the things that make up a dog, what do you have anymore? You may as well have a stuffed animal because you no longer have a dog because you've eliminated everything that made them a dog. And then once you start eliminating all those things that make them a dog, it starts to become a welfare issue. So we always have to keep in mind welfare issues as well. Um, so I've, I'm Bringing up the five freedoms, there's other ways to look at welfare, but the five freedoms was um, originally adopted in the UK in, I believe it was 1965, um, as a means to look at the welfare of livestock. But since then, it has really become the basis for animal care protocol worldwide. And the five freedoms in general are freedom from hunger and thirst. So, right, everybody feeds and waters their dog. Check. Check. Freedom from discomfort, okay? My dog has a great bed to lay in, check. Freedom from pain, injury, or disease, right? Take my dog to the vet when, but sometimes we don't see when there's pain. That's when I, you know, that's why I always tell people, if you're seeing behavior problems, take them to the vet. There may be some underlying things that we're not seeing. So check, check. Then we get into freedom to express normal behaviors. And that's where we fall you know, below the bar with our dogs, because we are really trying to stop them from performing normal behaviors. And then the final one is freedom from fear and distress, right? So no abuse of, of the animal. So when we talk about um, 
you know, the welfare issues and stuff, I always talk to my clients about choice and control or agency, if you want to call it that. Um, it's defined as the ability to have some control over their environment to be able to make choices. So think about what does your dog actually have choice over in their life? See if you can come up with three things that they truly have choice over. And it's not a do this or, or you know, you know you're going to get a coat on or or you're not going to go for a walk or something. It's got to be two desirable outcomes. So would you like this treat or would you like this treat? When we're on a walk, would you like to go down that trail or would you like to go down that trail? Because we seem to think of dogs as they're not allowed to say no. Why are, why are the only animals who are not allowed to say no are dogs, right? If we get a Halloween costume, I'm not going to go out and try and put it on a wolf. I'm not going to go to the zoo and try and fit it on a tiger. I'm probably not even going to fit it on my cat if he growls and, and, and scratches at me. But when I get a Halloween costume for my dog, gosh darn it, he's going to wear that costume and he's going to enjoy it because I bought it for him and he looks cute. You know, and we really got to think about the fact that we don't give our dogs any choice and control. We really need to think about allowing them some choice and control. So what I tell my clients is you can roll with it, you can provide opportunities, you can manage it, or you can provide alternative outlets. So every first Monday of the month, I live about three blocks from the tornado siren in town and they test it on that day. And every month, this is what I have. <laughs> And they don't go on very long. They maybe go on for a minute if they're really going at it. And then they stop. And to be honest, I've got four dogs. It would take me longer to quiet them down by giving them, going and get, finding treats and, and playing with them than it would be to just let them howl. Just roll with it. Let them howl for a few minutes. Who's it hurting? Providing opportunities, right? This was early spring. We went for a walk um, and we were out and they found this gopher hole. And they must have spent 45 minutes sniffing, everybody taking turns sniffing down that gopher hole. And I would say every other day, we went back to that same gopher hole looking to see if there were gopher holes around, you know. So giving them a prop providing opportunities. You may need to manage the opportunities, right? So this is my dogs and my chickens out in the backyard scatter feeding for their dinner. So they're getting an opportunity to use their nose and to scavenge. Then we've got management, right? You can keep the dog corralled in or you can corral the stuff in. So if the problem was the dog was taking stuff off of that counter, use the fence and corral in that space so they can't get to the counter, right? And they can have access to the rest of the space. Use gates. If your dog isn't up loud upstairs, instead of yelling at him every time he comes upstairs, put up a gate. Garbage cans. Dogs are scavengers. So they're going to get in the garbage can. I mean, there's that they're a dog. So you can manage it, get a dog proof garbage can, put your garbage cans in a closet or in a cabinet, or be a little more in, um, you know, ingenious where this person um, flipped up a dog crate, stuck their garbage can inside, and now they have a locking lid. So three quick cases, and then we'll answer questions. And I'm sorry I took so long today. Um, so case number one, we have a female two-year-old Australian Shepherd she was adopted in 2021 at four months old, rescued from a lit with a litter from a puppy mill. She lives in a condo with a small fenced yard. She gets two walks a day, about 20 minutes each. She's free fed. Um, two issues they called me about, nipping children in the home. They have a two, a four, and a six-year-old. And then barking and lunging at visitors as they enter the home. Once people come in, she settles down. But as soon as people get up to go to the bathroom or something, then she's back at it, trying to hurt them and move them around. There have been several bites, nothing serious, quote unquote, but there have been several bites. So what do we do? First step after we talk about all of those other things we just went over, we separate stuff into where do they fit within the legs, right? So we've got the self, the female spade, two years. Does she have any pain? We need to send her to the vet to see. We've got our environment stuff, right? She lives in a condo with a small yard. She's kenneled all day while they're at work. She's getting little to no energy or enrichment and exercise. She's living with children. She probably had little to no socialization coming out of a puppy mill. 
Um, what has she learned? She's learned that barking and growling works. She's learned that children are unpredictable and need to be controlled. Um, she's not learned things due to lack of socialization. And then we have the genetics part of it, right? So I kind of shuffle these things. And I don't necessarily write this stuff on a piece of paper, but I shuffle this thing, stuff around in my head. And then we come up with a plan, right? So our plan is going to include a lot of different things, right? It's going to include some education. We're going to talk about body language. We're going to talk about consent and control. We're certainly going to talk about the safety of the kids. Um, we're going to talk about the breed, what they were bred to do, what we can expect to be easy to fix and, you know, not so easy to change things that we shouldn't change, right? We're going to talk about the individual. Can we add more mental and physical enrichment? Can we do add some puzzle games? Australian shepherds, those herding breeds are just, their mind is going all the time. So can we get puzzle games and all that kind of stuff in? Maybe we need to do some confidence building. If she had no socialization, she might be scared of people coming into the house. So depending on what her body language looks like when she's barking and lunging at people, it might be a fear thing that we could do some confidence building with. Um, management and safety. So anytime you have a dog biting or if you have kids involved, you've always got to think about management and safety. So using baby gates and X pens and stuff to keep kids safe. You never, ever, ever leave kids and dogs alone together. You know, and especially if you've got a dog that's this tall and you have a two-year-old that's eye level with that dog's mouth and we know that dog has bitten, man, that is an absolute horrific disaster waiting to happen because the first place that dog's gonna, gonna bite is that little kid's face because that's what's right there, right? So we wanna think about muzzle training for this dog for, for working with her because she has bitten people before. And that can be done in a very um, you know kind and, and fun way so that dogs enjoy having a muzzle on. Adding again, adding a bunch of enrichment, getting some playing with her food rather than just free fed in a bowl. Let's play with her food, make it fun, adding some more exercise. So you've got three little kids. You can't do a two and a half hour walk twice a day. Can you do 15 minutes of tug or flirt pull in the backyard? Can you do 15 minutes of training some tricks? So things that, that are keeping in mind the, the human's legs. And then we have um, teaching. So maybe teaching some sort of a greeting pattern, um, a hangout hack, which I'll go over in just a second. Um, teaching the dog kind of when you're off duty, right? Dogs, herding dogs need to control chaos. If you're gonna have a Super Bowl party, then maybe the best thing to do is let that dog be off duty. Put him in his kennel with, with a big bone and then nobody needs to worry and the dog doesn't need to worry. He's off duty. He doesn't have to worry about controlling things. Mr. Rogers hack, and I'll go over that when we talk about the third case, but that's really um, helping the dog understand what's happening. And then if I were to talk about training, it may be training cues. It may be a leave at a place, some desensitization, but that again, that is going to be dependent on what trainer you go to. We may talk about some what ifs, you know, what if the person doesn't want to muzzle train the dog. What if they don't want to put up gates between the kids, right? So then we need to have some longer conversations about some other alternatives. Um, the hangout hack, really teaching a dog to just, when, it, when it's appropriate, just kind of lay down and relax. You don't have to worry about it. So um, it's, um, Kim has developed this called the hangout hack. Um, Suzanne Clothier has got one that's almost, exact same thing, which is her really real relaxation. Um, you could do Karen overalls relaxation protocol, which is a little bit different still. Um, but in this case with the hangout hack, it's really just putting a leash on your dog. You want them to be able to stand up, sit down, lay down comfortably, but not, you know, move all over the room. So enough, a modern amount of leash. You're going to sit down, you know, you can put the leash underneath you. So to, to kind of, so you've got two hands available. Then you're gonna lose, use some treats to lure the dog down into a down. I, I don't use a cue because I want this to be something that I don't have to cue, that they just do it naturally. And once they're laying down, I reinforce the heck out of it right between their front legs. The reason I don't feed it out of my hand is because they're more apt to stand back up to follow my hand when I bring my hand back up. So we wanna reinforce between the front legs. And then as they get better at this, we're gonna start increasing the duration 
So how long can they lay there between treats or between allowing them to get up and move around and kind of reset? And we're going to increase the number of distractions. And as we're working on this, we're going to have the dog on a leash, maybe behind a fence or behind a gate as people come in, maybe with her muzzle on so that everybody is safe. And we're working through those um, that uh, protocol. Second one is um, Pippin. He is a male neutered 18 month old Great Pyrenees. Purchased him at eight weeks from a breeder. They did lots of research into breeds. They found a Great Pyrenees breeder um, out west who has been breeding Great Pyrenees for 25 years um, for their sheep farm. And um, they do lots of enrichment and stuff when the puppies are small. So they purchased from this breeder. This family lives in a cul-de-sac in a suburb. They have a large French bench yard. Unfortunately, the dog has to be inside all day because he barks when he's outside or spends all day barking. Um, in Richmond, they do longer walks, about 40 minutes twice a day, morning, usually in the morning before work and then when they get home from work. They have three issues going on. He's growling when he's being brushed and getting his paws wiped off. He growled at the vet the last time they were there when the vet was trying to take his temperature. Um, he's barking at people when they come on property, when they come in the house and when they're on walks and, um, he's guarding chew toys and stuff from the people in the house, no bites or fights, um, as of yet. So we look at different things. We have a great Pyrenees. What we have is a great Pyrenees from a working line. So he has bred into his line, very strong needs to guard property and protect his flock. Right. So that is leading right into some of the issues that we're having. Great Pyrenees are very crepuscular. Right. And these people are timing their walks right around the time. That the dog would be out patrolling for predators. So he is starting to see his cul-de-sac as an extension of his territory perimeter. So in the evening, in the morning, they're doing perimeter patrols as they go on their walk right? He's very much learned who belongs and who doesn't belong. He knows handling isn't any fun. Um, and he's reached social maturity. So all that fun, cute, fluffy, you can do anything you want with me is, you know, kind of starting to go away. I'm an adult now. And I'm just going to tell you when I'm not happy with what you're doing. So what are we going to do? Um, again, body language, um, pet consent, we're going to talk about the breed, the working line, the compuscular portion of what's going on. Um, and then we're going to talk about the individual and kind of, is he viewing the whole neighborhood as his territory? And how could we fix that, right? Could we change the where we walk and help prevent him from seeing everything as his territory? And that's kind of what may be causing him to start barking at people on the walk. Right. Again, um, muzzle training him. He is growling at a vet. So it would be a good idea to have a muzzle on him. Um, enrichment things. The biggest enrichment thing I would say is making sure he has a vantage point, a place where he can lay and watch during the day, a deck, something like that. And then what can we teach him? Um, off duty protocol. When people come over, we put you in a different space with a bone and you're off duty. You don't need to worry about who's coming in. Some cooperative care and consent and control. And then how about a pattern for a greeting ritual or how, how does he know who belongs and who we should let in, right? So the pattern hack and this, the pattern hack can be used for so many things. Um, but in the case of the guardian dogs, in general, dogs find patterns to be helpful because things are more predictable, right? Easier to navigate. If I know what's going to happen, then I can handle it. So if we think of guardian dogs as being, you know, the bouncers of the dog world, if you have permission to enter, if you have a ticket, I'm happy to let you in. If you don't have a ticket, no, not sorry, you're not coming in. So we work, you work with your family dog mediator to create a greeting pattern that would show your dog, how does he know when visitors come that that's, you know, who we should be greeting. The other thing I would certainly tell people is if you have an open door policy and you have a guardian dog, you need to stop the open door policy because, you know, they're going to, someone's going to come through that door and the dog's going to say, no way, you're not coming in. Um, so very simple things like that, managing the situation. Finally, we have Pixie, a little female spade, five-year-old chihuahua. She was purchased from a pet store. She lives in a condo. She has a yard, but no fence. 
Um, she has no enrichment at all. The dog spends, from what I could tell, spends all her time in the house. She uses potty pads. They don't go on walks. She plays in the house. Um, they don't have a tie out. Um, three major issues. She's growling and biting at everyone over everything. She hates all of the little outfits and won't get in her tote bag. And she barks constantly at everything and nothing. Too many bites to even count, right? None of them have needed stitches, but she is biting everybody at this point. The goal is so that the owner can trust the dog and take her out in her tote bag. Is that realistic? Well, we'll see. So what do, what do we know about the legs, right? Hands are bad. Every time hands come at me, they're lifting me up or putting clothes on me, right? Nobody listens. I can't trust anybody not to do that. Nobody listens to all of my little calming signals. So I'm just going to bite. I'm going to growl and I'm going to bite because that's what works. Um, and she's had a long learning history. She's five years old. And she's been doing this for five years, right? In Richmond or environment, you know, little to no time outside, little to no time alone or on the ground, you know, yada, yada, yada. She's a female spade, five years old. Does she have any medical pain allergies? We'll send her to the vet to see. And then we talk about the dog, the genetics. And then we're going to have what might be some hard conversations for this particular client. We're going to talk about body language and consent and control because those are two real big issues for this dog. Then the other thing we need to talk about is, you know, do a dog is a dog. A dog is not a stuffed animal to be dressed up and carried around in a purse, you know. So can we make some adjust adjustments to that part of the picture? Management and safety, um, you know, doing more consent, working with, with, the, with the choice and control. The barking issues, um, we can work through that. But starting out, you know, how about putting up some window film and some white noise so she can't hear and see everything that's outside the door? Let's put up an X pen out in the yard or a tie out so she can spend some time outside. So one of the great things that she, you know, really needs is some time outside by herself to chew a bone, to roll around in the grass. Let's get her some games, some toys, some exercise. Maybe teach, you know, as we get into the what are we going to train? Let's teach it. How do you, you know, I'm going to pick you up or can you hop in the bag kind of a cue. And then we have the Mr. Rogers hack. So that one is again, teaching that life's easier to handle if you know what's going on. So talk to your dog, tell them what things are, label things. Um, this works great for any dogs, reactive dogs. I've got reactive dogs and I label things. I group things. So all moving vehicles are a truck right and we see a truck and I'll say it's just a truck my dogs look at me and they get a treat Woo, okay no barking and lunging there we go and so when we're walking along and and they hear noises outside if I'm in my office working they hear the garbage truck they'll all lift their head and I'll say it's just a truck and they're all like oh okay no big deal I know what that is now you can pair that with alternative behaviors like barking at the window you can train a dog that um thank you. It's just a truck. Come over here and find it or come over here and, and um, get a treat, you know, so you can train them in alternative behavior or train cooperative care to go along with it. You know, I'm going to brush you now. And then, and so they know what's going on. So what we're doing here is creating patterns that they can predict. So again, patterns, patterns, patterns with dogs. So kind of the takeaway message, and I think we've still got a few minutes for, for questions. Um, your dog's unique because of his individual set of legs. Genetics is not predictive. It only gives you the possibilities and the limitations. Get to know your dog, understand his DNA and his breed history, and, and you'll start to understand why he's doing things and perhaps some of the needs that, that you could meet for him. Set your dog up for success. So thinking about realistic expectations for your dog. And then above all, you know, let your dog be a dog. Give him opportunities to be a dog and understand that, you know, a dog's going to bark, a dog's going to howl. And just kind of learn to roll with it sometimes. If you're struggling, reach out to a family dog mediator. Um, there's lots of them in the country now. Um, I want to finish with this really kind of great video that Mike Shikashio created. Um, I think it was the 2021 Aggression in Dogs Conference 
he started out with this great video on what is the purpose of a dog. So let's take a listen to this to kind of end things out.
So if you would like to learn more about family dog mediation and legs, um, Kim's book, Meet Your Dog, is out. Gives a lot more information on the her genetic groupings of dogs and um, what dogs fit in different groups. Um, the Family Dog Mediation um, website, familydogmediation.com, has more resources as well. If you're interested in the Family Dog Mediation course, it is currently on sale for 50% off. I'll put a link to um, to that in, in the chat, and it'll come with the recording as well. But that's good through March 15th, and the, the code you're going to want to use is spread the love, and I'll I'll share that again in the chat. Um, and here's my contact information. So um, you can email me, look at my website, my online courses. I've got a couple on body language, one for pet parents and one for professionals and my Facebook and Instagram. And so with that, I will stop my screen share and... Okay, Carrie, this was really, really interesting. Um, I, you you said things that a lot of um, dog parents probably haven't heard of before or thought about before. Um, I, there are just a few questions here. Um, your sources for your, your first dog comments when they appeared, where did you hear about that? Uh, some of those I've gotten out of uh, Kim's book. I've looked them up on Wikipedia and a couple of books on my shelf. So I don't have a particular um, individual source on that. And some of those dates may be off a little bit um, because they do like that very first dog, when did dogs appear resources is still being argued back and forth as to when that, when that happened. So um, I don't know that those those uh, dates can really be set in stone when we're still finding things out. Okay. Um, Eileen wrote that um, they have a dog that really doesn't love the car pants, et cetera. I don't know what she means. She must have meant plants. Um, where does this fit in legs? I, I don't know if you have enough information for that. Uh, you'd have to, I think you'd have to have more information on the particular dog to find out, you know, what, what are that dog's experiences with the car? Um, you know, some dogs like my Pippin, who's sitting here in the, in the, in the picture, um, has a difficult time with cars because it's the cars moving past him and he wants to dive at the window. Um, so the herding breeds have a problem with those things moving by. Um, some dogs get sick to their stomach um, because of ear canal issues or just vertigo issues. Um, so it, it really, it could be a medical thing. It could be a, a genetic thing. It could be an experience thing. Okay. Um, I guess she could always contact you. And Absolutely. All right. Um, Deborah says that two weeks ago, um, she adopted an Amish puppy mill breeder Border Collie Aussie Mix female, eight and a half years old. Uh, she came into our rescue with male breeder and three puppies. She has been spayed and had dental work done. He is temperamental. Wait, his temperament is so sweet. She is puzzle game. What? She is puzzle games and commands, doing very well in the house and has learned to ignore the cat. My question is, when she comes to me for attention, she licks incessantly. Okay, so I, I think you're asking, what does that licking mean? Um, some dogs- And someone else said that their dog does the same thing, licks with concentration. It, yeah, and that's it's that's easier to see if you if 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 a person can actually see what they're doing because is it is the dog coming to you because they really want to be pet or are they coming to you because they feel like they don't have a choice and then the licking is telling you I'm not comfortable with this is it just an incessant licking because they're anxious dogs will when dogs are anxious they will chew they will lick. So um, anxious dogs, you'll sometimes see have like bare spots on their forearms or on their 
hips and stuff where they're actually licking and biting because of, of nervousness. Um, so it, 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 that again has, this needs to be a, have to see it to, and get more history to, to really know what that is. Okay. Um, here is one from Kelly. I have a rescue from Puerto Rico. I adopted him when he was four months old. I guess he's a world dog because all his breeds are less than 30%, but he is Cocker, Russell Terrier, Chihuahua, and Poodle, plus other breeds. He has always had separation anxiety and excessive barking. At around one year old or a bit older, he started to exhibit fear, aggression to strangers, and dogs on leash. He has bit a couple of my friends. He barks at delivery trucks. I feel like I'm doing a lot for his environment with sniffing, choice, and consent. I'm doing a muzzle when strangers come, and he has done really great with that. I say he is my empath absorbing all energy. I don't know what my question is other than what else can I be doing for him? I should add that I'm hoping to foster Aussies and I'm concerned about what I can do to ensure safety between the foster dog and my dog. He does fine with many lower key dogs. I had an Aussie that was very mellow and was his buddy. So kind of the first question is, kind of answered in the fact that the dog came from Puerto Rico um, because the dog was probably, I mean, he would probably had been born as a village dog. And so his DNA set him up to be a village dog. And so when we transfer those dogs into what we consider to be a better place, um, it's number one, scary. I mean, if, if you look at the, the, um, the culture and, and the amount of technology and cars and, and things like big buildings and smells and all those things that you would find in Puerto Rico versus what you're finding. And I don't know where you're, where you're at, but let's just say a suburb. Um, it's going to be like transporting us to Mars and saying, here, go for it. Um, and it's, it's scary. They don't know what, what to do. So I would do things like number one, I would find places where you can walk that are, um, very quiet. So if you can walk in parks or, or if it's allowed, cemeteries are a great place. Um, uh, I walk my dogs over on university campus because there's all kinds of wide open spaces and I have lots of room to just kind of let them walk and sniff and walk at times of day when there's not a lot of people around or eliminate some of the walks. Dogs don't have to go on walks. You know, you can do stuff in the backyard with sniffing and puzzles and things like that. Um, look up free work. Um, and if you, if you email me, I can send you some links to that, but helping the dog with kind of a scatter feed, um, uh, set up, we can add novel items and stuff in for the dog to learn to explore and kind of build confidence that way. Um, if the dog doesn't want to meet strangers, go with the off duty hack and put the dog in the other room. Um, you know, give them a bone and let them go in the other room. They don't need to come out and meet people. That's one of the biggest things we need to understand is some dogs love to be around people and other dogs find it too stressful. Um, my Aussies find it too stressful because they want to control everybody. Other dogs are afraid of people they don't know. And so it's stressful. So, you know, let the dog lead you. Um, what else can I say? As far as fostering Aussies, man, that's a crapshoot. It depends on the dog. It really depends on the dog. When I went to get a second dog, when I had just my one Aussie, we met five or six different dogs before she found a dog that she would, and with Pippin, who would, she would allow to sit next to him and next to her. So it really would be a meet and greet ahead of time. You know, I might be able to foster this dog, but we have to meet first. So lots of pointers I could give you, um, but yeah, feel free to email me. Uh, Carrie, are you okay to continue for 
Yeah. A few more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I knew I was going to go long and I apologize to anybody who has to get off. Um, okay. I, I appreciate how you are spreading the message of letting dogs be themselves and taking them into consideration. I certainly agree. For instance, I usually let my little Pomeranian bark when she wants to outside, but she gets called vicious, even though she shows no aggression. However, I maintain that without changing laws, rules for dogs, they cannot really be themselves. How do we deal with that? And then someone after that wrote that that's a good point. A lot of times people will ask if your dog is friendly. And in my head, I think he's very friendly and has doggy friends he plays very well with. But he also doesn't want to say hi to every dog we pass on leash. You know, and both of those are super great points. I think a lot of it is education for people to understand dogs and to know what dogs are saying. So if you understand body language, you can tell yourself whether or not the dog wants to greet you, right? If, if we understand body language, we're never going to walk close enough to a dog to make them bark um, because we will know before they ever bark with all the signals that they give us that they don't want to greet us. Um I don't know the answer to that because without changing a whole lot of stuff, there's, you know, there's not a lot of things you can do because the way we set up our cities is, is aversive for dogs. Everything is on a straight line and it is difficult for dogs to walk. You know, dogs don't greet each other straight head on nose to nose. And when you see dogs running at each other, nose to nose, one dog turns and, and heads the other way and turns their head away if they meet nose to nose, it very often ends not well. And so when we are walking down the sidewalk and we're coming towards someone and we're asking dogs to get close, 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 close to a dog in a hallway or an apartment or on the sidewalk, that's aggressive to those dogs. That's an aggressive stance. And oftentimes one of the dogs is pulling forward and leaning into their harness because they're, you know, they want to get there quicker. And that looks aggressive. And so simple things like, you know, with my dogs and some of it is because I walk four dogs and I, I move out of the way because I, I take up the whole sidewalk other ways, but just cross the street. You know, if it's, if your dog is not comfortable greeting people and people think your dog is really cute and they want to pet him and you know, they're going to ask cross the street, just go to the other side of the street. Everybody's going to be happier. Um, you know, you don't have to walk your dog, go find a sniff spot. And take your dog and let them run there. Take them out in, into a park and put them on a long line and let them sniff. And if people say they want to pet him, just say he's in training. He's contagious. You know, I'm contagious. I have COVID. You know, say anything. You know, just you don't have to let him pet your dog. But yeah, it's okay. hard. It's hard. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think we're going to see you know, HOA rules or city rules change anytime soon, um, which I think is some of what you were asking. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I have a mouthy 11 month old puppy uh, coping by giving her lots of things to chew to minimize her desire to chew on me. How long does mouthy behavior last? And do you have other tips? Uh, mouthy behavior can last forever in some dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, so got, that depends on the dog, but one good tip, and I didn't throw it in here is what we call the Carl hack. Um, so picking up a, one of those large lifelike stuffed dogs or a, just a big, huge stuffed animal and letting playing with the dog through that toy and letting them just beat the tar out of that toy. Um, and getting out that because they've got that energy and that need to play and wrestle and our hands cannot handle that. And so letting them just beat the tar out of that toy and get their energy out on that. I, I recommend that people have one of those that they only get it out in times when that dog is really wants to get rough and wants to get the zoomies or whatever, then get out your stuffed toy and play with it. So it saves your hands because you can play with the dog through the toy 
and the dog is getting all that energy biting and stuff out on the toy. Works great for dogs who are either puppies or single 11 month old dogs who are single dogs who don't have another dog they can play with. I'm just thinking about that. Um, wouldn't you think for some dogs, though, that would be an issue? Letting him, you know. Letting him be, be aggressive? Um, I think yeah. if you, if you saw it extending to other dogs, then yes, I would put a stop to it. Um, out of all the FDMs who are doing that particular hack right now, I don't know anybody who's had, um, bad side effects other than the dog is not mouthing like he was before because he's, he's getting, they only mouth because, you know, they do it because they have a need. And if you get them, if you let them take it out, take that need out on the false, the, the pretend dog, then they meet the need. They're not going to need to take it out on you or any other dog, right? And so it's a matter of meeting the need. But I would say, try that. If you see him acting more aggressively toward another dog, then stop with the stuffed toy, contact a dog trainer or a family dog mediator right away and try and figure out what, yeah. what else is going on there. Um, Kendra wants to know if family dog mediation has a position on medicating dogs for behavior concerns like separation anxiety. I would say that family dog mediation does not have a particular stance on that. I would say that's more of the particular trainer. And I would say more, more FDMs than not have the... Um, have the stance that medication, if medication works, I mean, it, you're, you're not trying to drug the dog, you're trying to help the dog's brain chemistry, be able to handle that anxiety. And in, in the case of anxious dogs, separation, anxiety, aggressive dogs, if medication helps them process that information so that they can think in order to learn, then bring on the medication. Um, and if you look at um, Dr. Jen Summerfield, Dr. Chris Pockel, who are both um, veterinary behaviorists, they will both say that even in puppies, when they see these behaviors in puppies, um, bringing medication on board earlier, so the dog hasn't had years of practicing this anxious behavior, bringing it on early is better. Because once you get the brain chemistry working correctly, the dog is in a place where he can learn something new and learn alternative behaviors. So my position is medication is good, and but that is something you'd have to discuss with your particular trainer. Okay, this is Maya again, and I know what my reaction is to what she's writing, but you answer first. Um, her dog adores running. It's the only play enrichment that she wants, but dogs cannot be off leash. So I have to let her go when hiking, and deal with getting yelled at. We also cannot bring them into stores, which means she has to stay at home or in the car. Terrible options. So I pretend she is a service dog. How can we claim dogs are our best friends if we leave them at home all day and don't let them inside establishments? Oh, man, that is a, <laughs> a lot to unpack in that one. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to kind of go through them step by step. The only player or enrichment she wants, I would have to question that because I think um, a lot of dogs, um, if you, you, can, you can teach or help them learn other fun games to play, right? I wouldn't enjoy, I wouldn't enjoy, um, Scrabble if I didn't know how to play it, but if somebody took me the time, took the time to teach me how to play it, I'd probably enjoy it, you know, so that kind of, I would, I would venture to say that's probably not the only thing she ever wants. Um, dogs can't be off leash. Correct. Dogs should not be off leash if they do not have an absolute solid recall. That is for the safety of everybody involved. If your dog runs off and won't come back and gets hit by a car, if it bites somebody, if it runs to play with another dog who is on leash because it can't handle other dogs being close to it, 
jumps in its face and your dog gets hurt or your dog hurts that dog. There are so many things that can go wrong in that scenario. So I would say find a sniff spot that is enclosed and take the dog there or put her on a long line um, okay. while you're working sniff through sniffspot.com. And mm -hmm. what a sniff spot is are people have fence yards or, you know, their property that they will rent out to people with dogs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a specific amount of time. And that would be a, a good option. I, what you're forgetting, Maya, is that um, if you had one of those dogs that was afraid of other dogs, uh, you would be the one yelling at a mm -hmm. loose dog. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you have to look at it from the other's point of view as yeah. well. You know, and we go into and the... A lot of, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. You know, if we well, pretend I, the dog is a service dog, you know, that's opening a whole nother... That's a legal thing, right? You can get in trouble for that. And the problem is, is, is if we have people who are pretending that their dogs are service dogs or emotional support dogs or therapy dogs, and I have to bring my dog with me, but they don't take the time to train that dog or the dog is not capable of handling or coping with being in a store. Then, you know, they're, they're running up into the face of a service dog who is there to monitor their handler for, you know, it could be heart palpitations or anxiety or whether, so you're endangering a person by doing that. Um, but you're also endangering the whole, um, the whole concept of a service dog. Yeah. If, if, you know, if we have dogs coming in who aren't service dogs who are biting people or, you know, acting horrible, then there's going to be laws made that nobody can bring a dog anywhere. And then why can't we bring dogs anywhere for that exact reason? We, we don't, um, we don't teach We like to teach our dogs to, you know, kind of stick with us. We don't um, socialize in enough manners and, you know, laws don't allow it. So it's really difficult in this country um, to have a dog out and about. And there are a lot of places that will let you bring your dog. Mm -hmm. um, Home Depot. Uh, actually Bloomingdale's, which surprised me. I mean, maybe you can look it up in your own area, mm -hmm. but there are places that, that you can take your dog with you yeah. without the dog being called a service dog. Um, another thing, when she mentioned the only play enrichment that, that her dog likes is running, you mentioned flirt poles a number of times. And I wanted you to explain what a flirt pole is. Um, so a flirt pole is, is, you know, the cat toys that look like a fishing pole with a line and a toy attached to it. And you kind of jiggle it for the cat to bat at. It's the dog size version of that. So a really easy to, way to make one is to take a, um, you can even take a broom handle, tie, you know, a string to the end, tie a toy at the other end um, and um, just kind of jiggle it around. And what you want to do is put it on the ground. So look up YouTube videos or flirt poles or some really good how to use a flirt pole. Um, but you're, you're kind of, you're pulling prey for the dog to chase and you do it in different directions. So the dog is chasing it and you let them catch it every once in a while, you know, squeak the squeaker, then they let go and they sit down and they chase it again. So you're letting them chase and capture prey is what you're doing. I think one of the speakers that we have um, has recommend, recommended squishy face flirt poles. Mm -hmm. if, Those are good ones. If you don't want to make your own. Um, and they're on Amazon. A similar toy is called the Chasen Pole. And it's the same idea, but it's always on the ground. Yeah. So you could look up both of those. Yeah. So they're, that one's like, that toys. one's more like, I think the chase and pull is a little more like lure coursing. Because don't, uh, don't you set it up on a pathway, on a, on a pattern? No. And it you moves don't, on yeah. like a trap. You don't have one. to. Yeah. But that you just one, move it wherever you want. Okay. It's just more 
on the ground than instead of coming from above. It's I, that that's what I, I had never heard of a flirt pole until uh, two years ago, and I always had a chasing pole. Um, anyway, um, well, okay. Yeah, there's there's a there, lot of there. chat around why we can't bring dogs places. And you know, and the other argument I would have is there are really few and dogs few and far between who really want to go shopping with you. Um, you know, and just learning body language and stuff and those really subtle cues that dogs are giving. I think a lot of people who think their dogs want to go would find out that their dogs, once they're there, are not comfortable in those spaces. Um, so giving the dog, you know, something really fun to chew on at home with some NPR or some reggae music going in the background is much more what your dog wants to do and just nap while you're gone. Okay. And Maya says that the service dog was theoretical. It's not something that she does. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let me see if there's, it's, we're really running late. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, I don't think I saw anything else. No, I think that's probably about it. I just really want to thank you. This was fascinating. Good, um, good. I'm glad you enjoyed um, it. Okay. Um, everybody, you know how to get in touch with uh, Carrie if you need to. I hope you had that, the, yep. uh, what do you call it, uh, the uh, int the information. Do you want to leave that up? Or do yeah, you get I can I it? can pop that back up and leave the chat up for a little bit. I also put the link for if anybody is interested in the um, FDM course at 50% off. I put the link in there um, where you can purchase it and get the 50% off with that code. So I will put my information back up and I will leave the chat up for a little bit. If anybody okay. wants to copy anything out of there and, um, then I'll and I put the out. link to your article on, uh, body language on mm -hmm. your website. Okay, great. So thank they can you. also reach you through your website. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Have a good rest of the weekend. See you next time. And thanks again, Carrie. Thank you.